Wes, I'm, I'm Tim Hitchens, I'm the president of the college, and I was just going to say a few words and then hand over to, to Leslie. So we're absolutely delighted to have with us tonight Wes Moore. Um, and as you'll hear, he's got an extraordinary life story. Uh, he was born in Baltimore, well known to anyone who's seen The Wire. Uh, his father, a respected black American broadcast journalist. Uh, his mother, a media professional from Jamaica. Um, and the early death of his father left him and his two sisters in the loving care of his mother and grandparents in the Bronx. And reading between the lines, it's clear that pretty strong and compassionate parenting and grandparenting brought him through what could have been challenging circumstances. Um, his hard work produced academic success and he studied international relations and economics at Johns Hopkins uh, and then international relations here as a Rhodes Scholar at Wolfson. Uh, and I think he's the perfect advertisement for Rhodes Scholars and indeed his face, he may not know this, but his face is currently appearing on the boards surrounding the latest building works at Rhodes House here in Oxford. Um, Wes started his career after Oxford at Deutsche Bank in London. Uh, and then he joined the 82nd Airborne Division of the US Army. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that specializes in parachute assault operations into denial areas. Uh, and he went to Afghanistan. Uh, and on his return from Afghanistan, he was uh, a White House fellow, working particularly on ensuring that foreign aid was well spent. Uh, and then he returned to the world of finance with Citigroup. And what, what a range of experience and what a story for the son of a single mother in the Bronx. But Wes, I know, was struck not just by what he'd been able to achieve, but also by the burning question of why someone who'd started life in the same place as him wasn't able to fulfill his potential in the same way. And this led to the publication of The Other Wes Moore in 2010, which tracked two young Baltimore boys called Wes Moore, one him, the other a man serving a life sentence for murder. Why the divergence? What role do family, education, opportunity play, especially for boys of color? Uh, Wes continues his work in print and media, but he's also CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation, which combines investment principles and philanthropy to target poverty in New York, funding schools, food banks and shelters, for example. Despite the name Robin Hood, there's no stealing from the rich, but just a judicious reallocation of resources. Um, and he also continues to advocate for serving those who served in the US military overseas. You feel that these are really only the first chapters of a life which will take many more surprising turns. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wes Moore in interview with our very own Leslie Nelson Addy. Leslie, please take it away. Thank you so much, Sir Tim, and welcome again, Wes. We're really, really happy to have you here. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to hear all of your thoughts and ideas and experiences, um, both in terms of the book, but also in terms of all the great work that you're doing um, in communities across America. Um, there are so many things I have to ask you, but I'm going to start by um, asking straight up about, um, let's, let's start slow. Let's start out with what your experiences like were um, growing up in Baltimore. And I just wanted to find out, like, did your mum have a conversation with you about how to be out in Baltimore, how to act, how to present yourself, how to conduct yourself while you were out there? And have you found yourself having the same kind of conversations with your children out in New York? So just wanted to start out there. Um, for, and again, you know, it is such a joy to be with you. And thank you, thank you. Uh, it, it really is, I'm just, I'm thankful to be with, uh, with uh, my, my, my Oxford and my Wilson family. Um, it's a great question. Um, and I think about it even in context of the neighborhood that I live in right now. Um, the neighbor, I live in Baltimore still. Uh, and, uh, but the neighborhood I live in was a neighborhood that my mother used to tell me not to go to. Um, it was a neighborhood that really up until I think 30 years ago, um, maybe a little longer, but about 30 years ago, they actually had bans on blacks and Jews. Could not buy homes inside this neighborhood. 
And my mother was always fearful of this neighborhood to the point that she said, you know, if you go there, they're going to assume you're not from there and will probably bother and harass and so on and so forth. And so this was one of the places that was never really a place that, uh, you know, we were told that we, sh we should go to. And it's now the place where I'm raising my children. Yeah. And, but I think about that in context of, you know, this is a city as Baltimore that I'm incredibly proud of that I, I am, I am, I, I love, I love being here. I love raising my family here, but I also know that it is the city that is the birthplace of some of the most racist and inhumane policies that were put towards people inside of this country. You know, it was, it, it was, it was the, it was the birthplace of redlining. I was knowing, you know, redlining is literally the act of taking a map and drawing red lines on where people could live and could not live based on skin color. It was the, it was a place of, of, you know, racial segregation when it came to, when it came to not just housing, but also banking segregate, uh, segregation, liquidity segregation, school segregation. And so it was one of these things where I think we came up uh, both in a place and in a space where you just had these, you know, while you loved your home and you loved the people around you and you loved, you know, your neighbors, um, you also had these constant reminders of how equitable things can be for people. Um, and, I, and I think it was, um, so being here kind of in this space, uh, I'm thankful that there are certain conversations that I don't have to have with my daughter and my son. Um, I'm also very cognizant of the fact that there are conversations that I have to still have with my daughter and my son um, that other people, other neighbors, they just don't have to have with theirs. And that reality still very much sits on me. Mm. And I remember you writing in the book Five Days how, um, you know, there's that question of, oh, you're crazy to go back to Baltimore. Is that attitude still around or has that kind of evolved a little bit? You know, to return back to Baltimore seems like you want to get out, you should get out. So how is it like now? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's great because I remember when having that initial conversation where people were like, you know, is everything okay? When I told them I was coming back home, is everything okay? Is, is yeah. mom okay? Is, I'm like, mom is good. They're like, you lose your job? I'm like, nah, I didn't lose my job. I just want to come home. And, and, and there was kind of like a, you know, I, I would say like the universal response of many of my friends could be really summed up in one word and that's why. You're like, you know, you're, you're doing well and you're someplace else. Kind of stuff. But, I, I, but I do think it is, it is kind of like this psychological thing that still very much, you know, exists for people, um, you know, about, about, about where we are and who we are and the conditions that we live in and, and, and exist in and how exactly to think about that and think through that um, as we're talking about the type of supports that we want to be able to provide for people. But, you know, I, I love Baltimore because I feel like in many ways our story is still being written. And the thing I love about Baltimore is, you know, you have a chance to actually be one of, uh, one of you know, in the case of Baltimore now, 600,000 people with your hand on the pen. Um, and that's a pretty cool feeling to be able to navigate through. Yeah, for sure. I was going to say that um, I want to go into the book a little bit more now, but I would say that I fell in love with Baltimore reading the book, like seeing the different personalities and Obviously, the, the, the city seems really polar opposite, like you've described, and also you do describe in the book as well, um, in terms of the different neighbourhoods and so forth. But there seems to be a unity at the same time. But I guess you'll talk a little bit more about that when I ask about social issues. So to anyone that hasn't read the book yet, definitely please go out, get the book. It's called Five Days. That's the book we're going to be discussing today. And it's ultimately about the community in Baltimore kind of coming together to express their frustrations, fears and their fight for justice in relation to police brutality in Baltimore following Freddie Gray's death. Um, West draws on accounts and experiences of various members of the community to explore the kind of complexity of emotions, the strong desire for change and some of the consequences of being involved in 
such an emotionally grueling socio-political battle like within your own home city despite it being important but also that kind of conflict between feeling hopeful and also maybe a sense of hopelessness as well maybe not having the economic power or um the kind of the the clout necessary in order to make changes so books amazing written by Westmore alongside the journalist Erica Green fantastic fantastic book so just thought I'd plug it um <laughs> so first of all <laughs> first of all I cried yeah while I read the timeline about Freddie I think the pain stems for me from the fact that like he's my brother, he's my friend, he's my son. He's like, he's just a normal young boy. You know, when you hear that kind of, the kind of outcome that he experienced, you think, gosh, what could he have done? You know, and you look at the timeline and you realize actually, no, he just had a normal life, like a young kid just growing up trying to make it. Um, and even though you intended to focus on those five days, you provided some really key, like poignant details about events that had happened in different people's lives, but Freddie's particularly. And why did you decide to do that? You know, I, um, I'm so glad you asked that question. And, and that was actually one of the last things that got added. And it was actually my editor who added it. Well, he said, he said, I, he said, I think you, cause you know, I finished the book and, felt good about it and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, I, I feel like something's missing. Because we follow the lives of these eight people. We follow, uh, you know, what, how they view those five days and what ended up happening with them. And he's like, I still think you need to center the reader before it all starts with, why are we even having this conversation? Right, absolutely. We need to tell about Freddie. Because that we, we follow these eight people that all wrapped around the life of this young man and um, without talking about him his eyes because he was gone by then you know this is a young man who was 25 years old who made eye contact with police that was his crime he made eye contact he made eye contact in a, in a high crime area that in that in his neighborhood that is enough to trigger probable cause probable cause was enough for the police to chase you and arrest you an hour after he was arrested he was in a coma a week after he was placed into a coma he died and um, we had all these debates and conversations about his death and what happened. And, and all those were important because there needed to be justice for Freddie. The other thing though we knew was this, was that you could not spend all of your time mourning his death if we did not spend time mourning his life. That this was a young man who was born premature and underweight. He was born to a mother who lived her entire life in deep poverty. She never made it to high school. She could not read or write. He, she also battled addiction for much of her life. And when he was born, he was already born exposed to heroin. You know, he gained enough weight that he could finally leave the house. They moved into a housing project in West Baltimore in 2009. That home and 480 other homes were cited in a civil lawsuit because of the endemic levels of lead. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., uh, indicates that any exposure to lead is, is harmful to the human Good, body. Yeah, exactly. you know? But if a person has anything more than five micrograms of lead in every deciliter of blood, that that person will have cognitive damage for the remainder of their life. Freddie Gray had 36. So this was a young man who was born premature, underweight, exposed to heroin, born into deep poverty and lead poisoned. And by that time in his life, he's two years old. So we cannot just spend time mourning his death if we're also not willing to mourn his life. And the fact that that week that he was in a coma was arguably the most peaceful week of his life because at least that week he was surrounded by doctors and nurses. At least that week, he was surrounded by activists and lawyers. At least that week, the entire city knew his name. At least that week, the entire city cared whether he lived or died. And I can't think of another week of his life where all those things would have been true. Yeah, that attention. Mm. That's the problem. Mm. 
it was really oh man honestly the timeline I thought well this is the first couple pages of the book so what's going to happen now like I'm reading the timeline and I've already broken down so goodness but it's it's really really important and and just even the moments that you included like Billy's experience with um his friend's family and seeing what happened to their home and um oh. Honestly, and Tawanda's experience with her students, which obviously is kind of an opposite to the um, Billy and Freddie's experiences, but even still, they just seem like po poignant moments to kind of humanise the people that you were focusing on and trying to kind of share with us th those um, five days of their lives. So thank you for that. Um, did you want to say something about Billy or did you want to move on to... I feel no. like you do. No, right okay. <laughs> Billy, Billy was, you know, Billy was an important, you know, uh, was an important character, uh, important individual uh, to be able to follow because actually in many ways, because I didn't follow Freddie during those five days, you know, Billy was kind of like the lens to be able to understand Freddie's story because Billy was, you know, not just Freddie's lawyer, uh, the lawyer for the Gray family, but he's like this legendary character legendary character in Baltimore City and uh and I think watching the way he navigated and also he told he told so many beautiful stories but one story that he told was so interesting was when he went back to the neighborhood to see if he could get details about what happened to Fred and he talked about how historically when you go into neighborhoods and you ask them particularly things when it comes to police violence people's like mom I'm not saying anything I'm not I'm not mentioning anything and he's like with Freddie I saw something so different he's like with Freddie the streets were talking. Like people wanted to, they were like, Billy, right here is where it happened. Billy, da -da. he said he had never experienced that before. And he just said, you know, the, the, the streets wanted justice. They wanted justice for Freddie. And he said it was just a different type of experience than he had ever witnessed, you know, in his, in his decades uh, of service before him. Yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I feel like you wrote all the narratives so beautifully. My per personal favourite has got to be Billy's life. I'm not going to lie. Like, I feel the same. <laughs> Definitely the star of the show. Um, and But I noticed that you started and ended the book with reference to Tawanda's narrative. Um, powerful, powerful, powerful. That was intentional. That's, that's great. Wow, that's, that's impressive. You picked it up. <laughs> that was very intentional. Yeah, so, yeah. So I wanted to find out, like, first of all, why did you do that, and then which of the people's narratives kind of resonate with you most? I know you've spoken a bit about Billy, but obviously, if there's anyone else, you can definitely add them, especially in terms of your own journey as well. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because um, one of the things I really loved about this book and telling the story, um, it was the idea. That, um, that no matter who you were, no matter where you kind of were, what you thought, there was somebody in the book who probably really resonated with you. And there was somebody in the book who you completely disagreed with. But the beautiful thing about that is, you know, it's kind of like, that's life. And I remember kind of, you know, going through these different characters and thinking, thinking through these different individuals. Um, and, you know, the fact that you had someone like a, a Mark Partee, who was a police major, who grew up in West Baltimore, and one of the highest ranking African-American police officers, and who says, you know, I know that no one in my, none of my colleagues woke up that morning with homicide in their mind. But I also know that why for a kid in West Baltimore, why they don't believe me, you know, or whether it's, whether it was, you know, Anthony, uh, who I love, I was, I was a, you know, a, a general manager of a local roller skating rink, um, but who, 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 who take on kids and, and hire young people who no one else would hire, but he did it because he's like, that used to be me. And those were also the same young people who saved Shake and Bake the night of the unrest, you know? But, but I think about Tawanda, where Tawanda is just an extraordinary soul. You know, she, her brother died in police custody just two years before Freddie Gray. And every single Wednesday, still to this day, she marches and she demands justice for her brother. Every single Wednesday. She has not missed a Wednesday. And so she's so proud of Baltimore when she sees Baltimore standing up and Baltimore demanding justice and Baltimore demanding adjustments to police and all this kind of stuff. But there is a part of her that 
is continuing to say is like, but where was this when my brother was killed? Mm. And so there is something so powerful about how those, I really enjoyed um, just how those narratives piece together. And then, you know, and the, and the chance to, you know, to kind of, you know, uh, think through it and work through it with Erica Green about, you know, okay, well, how do we make kind of like the weaving piece was something that was just awesome. No, I love that we um, that you ended with um, to wonder as well, because like you say, every Wednesday and hasn't missed one. So it kind of brings us away from just those five days into like the present day, hearing her voice last. Um, and what does this book represent to you before we go into the key social issues? What does this book represent for you? Because you've written quite a few, so yeah. <laughs> I think what this book, what this book really represents um, to me was a chance to look at and understand the complexity of these various issues. That it's not, it's not simple, it's not easy. Um, this is hard stuff. More understanding how poverty shows itself and that it isn't just about the way people are living and existing. It's not just about the way, you know, the lack of transportation assets. It's not just about the air they are breathing, breathing and the water they are drinking. Um, it's also about things like the way they're pleased. And how all of these things factor into this constant reminder for people about how inequitable um, society can sometimes feel. And that's the really, that's, that's the thing that I think this book represents, you know, what I hoped was just a very holistic way of being able to address the disparities that we know exist. Yeah, absolutely. And that leads me quite nicely on to kind of you really do focus and you show that you're really interested in your your kind of experiences and even your organization, all of those things gear towards kind of supporting people who are raised in um, a state of like poverty of any level. Um, but you also predominantly focus on the black community. So can you talk to me a little bit about the kind of impact of this particular intersection between black and poor or class in general? Um, and it would be great to also hear a little bit about black women too. Absolutely. And, 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 and to be clear, I think one of the things that were really important to highlight was the fact that poverty, you know, people say, well, is it, you know, is it race or is it class? The answer is you can't separate these two things. You know, poverty is racist. Poverty is sexist. Poverty is xenophobic. Poverty is homophobic. Poverty, I mean, like, and, and it's not saying that everyone doesn't experience poverty. All that, I, 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 all that is absolutely true. But it's also about the fact that we cannot pretend like public policy and history and initiatives are not creating these massive disparities that we see within our society. You know, in the United States, there's a 10 to one racial wealth gap, right? 10 to one. That's not because one family worked 10 times harder. That's because there are structural barriers that still continue to exist. That's because of things like the history of redlining, discriminatory housing policies, and discriminatory lending policies, and, 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 and job discrimination. It is because of the fact that currently in the United States, a black child who's born, born to parents in the top income quintile is just as likely to fall into the bottom income quartile in adulthood as they are to stay in the top income quintile. Compared to uh, white children who are nearly five times as likely to remain in the top quartile, right? That's not because white children who were born in the top income quintile had just a greater work ethic. There are systems that are still very much in place. And I think it's important that we talk about that when it comes to things like race and racism. Because I think that people sometimes get confused when they think that racism is just an act, right? If a person does X, there are, they, that is a racist act, right? This person, they attend a white supremacist rally. That is yeah. racist. Yeah. <laughs> You know, a person uses the N-word, that, yes, that is racist. However, racism isn't just an act. Racism is a system. It's a system that allows employers to be two times as likely to hire a white applicant as they are an equally qualified black, black applicant for the same entry position. It is a system that in the United States, you know, people say, and it's true, where we want people to get to higher education and graduate because a person with a college degree has an average lifetime benefit of a million dollars to someone who after lifetime earnings than someone who does not have a college degree. 
That's absolutely true until you disaggregate the data. And when you disaggregate the data, you see that actually a black person with a college degree has the same earning trajectory as a white high school dropout. This is data. And it shows that whether we're talking about the distinctions between black and white, whether we're talking about the fact that we still right now have a situation where men and women are still getting paid 71 cents to the dollar for the same job. That these measures, these issues, it cannot just simply be chalked up to work ethic or anything else. There are still structural challenges that have to be addressed if we're going to be serious about being able to create measures and levers of parity and equity and opportunity uh, between both race and also within sex as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, one of the kind of most poignant parts of the book for me was Anthony seeing the young girl cleaning the streets following the mayhem and continuing on with strength, beauty and resilience. Um, does this image reflect the attitude of the Baltimorean um, community today? Um, and you also repeatedly make connections between like the protests and the 1968 riots as well. Like, do you see that there's been a progression in um, towards this liberation that you're referring to um, and in what ways? It's such a good question. Um, Sorry, so many questions. Great, it's great. Um, so, you know, so that was one of the reasons I want to kind of cover five days was because, you know, it's important, it was important to see, because people always, oftentimes talk about the Monday, right? That was, that was the, 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 the night of the violence. That was the night of, that was the day of Freddie's funeral. A lot happened on Monday. Um, but it was important for me to kind of pull back and go both into what was the lead up to Monday and then what was the aftermath. And the aftermath became really important because you wanted to see how people responded. Like how do people respond to the National Guard getting called? How do people respond to everything getting shut down? How do people respond to the fact that the entire world on their news channels are watching your city burn? Um, and there was that beauty, I mean, I, I, and I remember, I will always remember also where I was when Anthony was telling me the story, how, you know, that was his day off from work. Tuesday's always his day off. Laying in bed, and he's watching the television about what happened last night, right in the area where Shake and Bake exists. And he sees this little girl with work gloves on there, you know, you know those work gloves that for most people go here, but yeah. well, we're up to her elbows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, just sweeping and raking debris, glass, trash. Um, and he thought to himself, he's like, you know, listen, I'm not a, I'm not a politician, so I can't give speeches. I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not rich, so I can't write checks. And he said, but I, I can skate. And my skaters can skate. And they decided to go into work that day on his day off and decided to go and skate and play music and have people dance and have people smile. That was his contribution. And I love, love, love that story because it is this, it's a very gentle reminder of the fact that we're, we're not asked to do everything, but all of us are asked to do something. And take your talent, take your gift, whatever that talent and that gift happens to be, and find ways to share it to bring joy. And that's in many ways, that's exactly what Anthony did. Anthony said, I cannot do it all. I don't know how to. I don't have the skill. I don't have the money. <laughs> you know, I don't have the social capital. So let me just do what I know how to do and let that be the guide in terms of what my contribution for the day was going to be. It's just so powerful so so powerful and it's like it gives off the message that yes we are fighting for justice but we also want to live as well we are going to enjoy our life while we continue that fight we don't stop our lives and and fight we you know do them together and I think that's really really important um 
Yeah. Um, and you draw an interesting link. So just to give you a bit of context, I used to be an English teacher and um, oh, I wow. do... <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! It's like, and I and I found a bunch of edits. <laughs> well, I no, actually I wasn't even going to go down. Well, no, actually I didn't find anything. <laughs> um, and anyway, I thought I'd tell you towards like getting towards the end, so you didn't feel like you had to do anything. <laughs> um, but I noticed a very subtle and interesting link that you drew between school leadership and their treatment of young, helpless, unarmed black youth and the police. And I thought that was really subtle and really interesting. And it reminds me a lot about kind of the conversations I've had with my supervisors since leaving school about this kind of complex, very subtle comparison. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the role of the education sector in perpetuating this systemic or institutional racism and how your organization and others like it are trying to kind of reverse those effects? Well, you know, I, I think it's, um, we have to appreciate the fact that um, our, our schools of education are not just places where people get degrees and not just places where people get credentials. I mean, our our schools, our primary schools and elementary schools in, in, in the U.S., I mean, these are, these are the largest food providers in our society. They're the largest health care providers in our society. They're the largest child care provider in our society. They are serving as a backbone for families, particularly families that are in situations where they need them the most. They're also the place where students in many ways get a chance to psychologically understand what are their values, what are their expectations, and what are the things that people are hoping they can actually do with their lives, right? It, it's a place where, where we are not just focusing on what is the academic credentialing, but where we're telling our kids every single day what we think about them and their future simply by looking at the buildings that we ask them to go to school in, simply by asking them about the the, 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 the precautions, simply by asking them about and at looking at the curriculum that they're being asked to, to, to read and learn and recite. And, you know, it's one of these things where I, I think about it for, you know, particularly as we're talking about for, for black and brown children, where, you know, I'm as big an advocate for STEM and, um, you know, mathematics and everything. I mean, like, I, I, I have a more quantitative mind than I do a qualitative mind. Like, numbers come easy to me. Um, words do not. <laughs> like, that takes more work for me than, than, than numbers do. Mm -hmm. um, but I also don't know this, is the most powerful things that happened to me during my educational process wasn't just when I was taking geometry or trigonometry or whatever like that. It was when I learned about the names of people like Tubman and Truth and Du Bois and Robeson and Baldwin, Hughes, and Marshall, right? They became really important to me because it went back and it continued to demonstrate to me that I belonged, that I come from incredible stock, that I come from a place of greatness and beauty and joy. And so that was the most important thing that I got was it wasn't just the credentialing, it was the belonging. And so I think when we're talking about what happens within our schools, um, whether it is how we think about the buildings or whether we think about the hyper-policing that sometimes exists within our educational frameworks, we have to remember just holistically, we are screaming to our children what we expect of them, from them without ever having to say a word. And we cannot pretend like they're not listening as we are trying to express that. Mm. Absolutely. In the verbal and nonverbal, for sure. Moving forward, right? Um, sometimes I personally feel like the, um, the dealing with all the policies and the systemic issues and so forth just seem extremely overwhelming. You know, when you talk about the individual act of racism, it's much easier to address, it's much easier to identify, it's much easier to actually kind of laugh off and do away with insofar as the consequences aren't too, you know, heavy. 
and still kind of live your life. But the systemic ones just seem intimidating, daunting, et cetera. So I just wanted to find out what continues to inspire you in hope that there will be liberation, that there will be a change, that these policies will not, um, will not continue to be etched in our experiences. Um, so that, you know, we are not like the people that were sitting in the pews when you were speaking at Freddie Gray's um, funeral. Yeah. You know, I, um, I, the, the thing that I think continues to give me both hope and motivation is understanding where that change is actually gonna come from. Um, and that we can't, you know, we understand that each one of us have an individual role and have a, have a large job to do, but we cannot fall under the illusion that individual acts of goodness are going to be enough to be able to pick up the rubble of just bad decisions from a policy front and systemic indifference, right? Because that's, we're talking about systemic indifference. Um, and actually in many ways, you know, systemic indifference might be actually be the kindest way of putting it. Um, you know, we, I, I, and so for example, you know, I, we talk about kind of like, what is the importance of structure and policy and that type of thing. Um, you know, take, for example, in the U.S. right now, in the U.S., um, there are, you know, ab about the cost of child poverty in the U.S. Um, is about $700 billion to $1.1 trillion a year. That's what the U.S. pays for child poverty every single year. We have a policy called the Child Tax Credit, which is basically, you know, an allotment that goes and takes place towards, you know, towards children towards families that have children who are family with families living in deep poverty. And, you know, this is a poverty fighting program that right now is in place that has had a level of you know, societal value, but has real holes. And part of those holes is that because of the way we measure who qualifies and who gets in, about 24 million children every year do not qualify for the child tax credit. And they don't qualify not because their parents make too much they don't qualify because their parents make too little. So we have a poverty fighting program that leaves 24 million children out because they're too deep in the poverty. Explain to me how that works. And so the point with that is that there is no philanthropy in the world that's gonna be able to cover that gap. That's a policy change. And so the thing that keeps me going and the thing that keeps me motivated and the keeps that keeps me striving for that is that like, you know, I was telling somebody, they say, you know, you run one of the largest charities in the U.S. I said, I don't run a charity. I don't believe in charity. I think charity is paternalistic. I think charity is, is offensive. I run a change organization because I'm not interested in making poverty more tolerable. I'm not interested in making poverty easier on people. I want it done. I want it gone. And I know we have the ability and the capacity and the wealth to make it so. I also just know that with the way we are looking at our policies right now, we are going to make it impossible on ourselves. And so, and it goes back to the stories that we talked about with Freddie. It goes back to all these things. We have to be serious and serious about how we are addressing these fundamental issues of fairness and kindness and goodness. If we're actually going to get us to a place where we all feel like we're doing everything that we need to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Um, such great gems. I'm definitely going to um, re-watch this because I have not been able to take notes because I've been focusing on what you're saying and actually being in conversation. <laughs> so thank you. Honestly, thank you so, so much. Um, we've just got, uh, well, we've got two questions um, really quickly from the audience. Um, uh, and the first one is, it says, going back to the initial question that I asked you um, about what your mother told you and what you've gone on to tell your children. Um, so Tim wants to know, what do, what do you say to your children about how to be, to survive and thrive? What, what are some of the things you share with them as a point of encouragement? Well, I mean, one of the things I, I share with them is I want them to know their history. Um, I want them to know where they come from because I want them to know that when you really do know your history, you know that you are never in a room that you don't belong in. And that was something that, frankly, I think I, I, I did suffer from. You know, I, I have to tell you, when I was, got a, first got a chance to go to Oxford 
you know, there was a bit of imposter syndrome. Oh, I know that feeling. <laughs> oh, you're walking around, you're like, yeah. what am I doing here? <laughs> and you're like waiting for someone to tap you on the shoulder and say, what are you doing here? <laughs> Right. I mean, that's a real thing. Yeah. And so, but it, 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 it takes, it takes not just a great deal of strength, but a brand that takes a great deal of training to be able to get over that. Yeah. hundred percent. And I want to train my kids that you are never in a room that you don't belong in. Know where you come from, know your history, know your glide path, know your DNA, because when you know that and you can appreciate that you never walk in a room with your head bowed. Because you know that every room that you are in, you just made that room better. Every room that you are in, you are there because you belong there. And that room would be markedly worse if you were not. And that's an important mentality to be able to walk into every single space that you enter into. Because frankly, you know, many other kids are. That's the privilege that they walk around with. And so why should you walk around with your head bowed? And so that's, I think, one of the big things that I try to stress to our, to our children. Know your history. Know where you come from. Because when you know that, you will have a much deeper sense of appreciation as to where you're going. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, that's inspired me. Thank you. <laughs> and um, you were a part of the... Um, we had a kind of um, people, kind of role models in Wolfson who were alumni and you were one of those um, role models that we had. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, we're hoping for a permanent fixture of your portraits and the other people that were featured in it as well. Um, and um, Maribel wants to find out like, who are your role models and who inspires you? And how do you feel about being a role model to us? as well <laughs> That's a good question. um you know I, I my i would say my 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 biggest role model is actually my grandfather and he was a uh he was actually the first one in our family born in the united states on my mother's side um he was born in south carolina my great-grandfather was a minister and a very vocal minister and vocal to the point that he started getting a lot of threats verbal threats and eventually turned into physical threats. And in the middle of the night, he picked up his wife, my great grandmother and his children, my grandfather included, and moved to not out of South Carolina, they moved out of the United States. They went back to Jamaica. And most of my family always pledged to never come back to the United States. And most never did. But my grandfather was always like, this is the country of my birth. Why should anyone tell me that I don't belong there? And in 1950, he became a minister. He actually became the first black minister in the history of the Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, and, and, you know, took on the same kind of threats that his father took. But he stayed and he fought. And, uh, you know, he was a man with a deep Jamaican accent his entire life. He was one of the most proudly American people that I've ever met. And he is a real hero to me because he just believed in this idea of sacrifice. He believed in this idea of, of, of make it better if you can. And I just have a deep amount of respect and love and admiration for, for, uh, for, for him, not just for what he did for our family, but what he did for so many other people um, inside as well, so. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That was really, really, really touching. Thank you, really inspiring. Well, Wes, you are an inspiration to us too. Thank and you. we are very proud to have you here with us. And we're very proud to have you as an alumni of um, Wilson College and Oxford University in general. Um, thank you so, so much for the conversation today. I really enjoyed speaking to you and finally getting to ask you about these questions. Um, it's my joy, it's my pleasure. I am so proud to be, to be Wilson. I'm so proud to be Oxford. I'm so, this was a fantastic conversation uh, and I wanna make sure that we all stay in touch. So again, bless you all. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, guests. I hope you all have a great evening. Have all a wonderful night. Bye. Thanks.